Hi everyone, it's Dr. Romney, and welcome back to this YouTube channel where we take on all things narcissism. And a lot of these videos also get made because of your suggestions, so don't hesitate on that comment section. If there's something you want to see made, please let us know or let us know through social media or any other way. Today we're going to take on a very interesting one, one which I'm sure a lot of you have thought about, which is the five ways that fairy tales get people sucked into or stuck into narcissistic relationships. Before I begin debunking or laying out those five things, please hit the bell, get notifications every time we post a new video, or better yet, subscribe, and then you'll be part of this community and people who are all wanting to learn more about narcissistic relationships. So let's talk about these five ways that fairy tales get people pulled into narcissistic relationships and then really, really stuck in those narcissistic relationships. So number one, Fairy tales tragically teach us that you can change someone with your love no matter how difficult he is. And you guys know that trope well in Beauty and the Beast. This is the narrative and the storyline that has launched and maintained so many narcissistic relationships. Think of the story of Beauty and the Beast, the well-intentioned Belle, a sort of a golden child, devoted to her father, goes into the ramshackle sort of fixer-upper mansion of the beast and fears for her life. But eventually she gives in and tries to win his rage over by hanging out with him, having dinner with him, and dancing with him. The takeaway on Beauty and the Beast is if you love someone enough and put up with enough of their stuff, then you can unleash the good part of them and live happily ever after. The reality is it doesn't work that way. Antagonistic, high conflict, rageful personality styles are not particularly amenable to change. And most of the people around them not only don't change them, they go on to experience pretty significant anxiety and self-doubt from being around them. In an honest telling of the story, Belle would more likely have developed PTSD and he would have continued raging around the messy castle than the other way around. Number two, these fairy tales leave you believing in being rescued and that if you endure your terrible dysfunctional narcissistic family that you will be rescued for it. So let's take a page out of Cinderella. Now Cinderella, through a bit of bad luck, ended up with an invalidating stepmother and was the scapegoat of her dysfunctional blended family system. She, of course, grew up more beautiful because, of course, all fairy tales are always about everything kind of ending up sort of fair, which is very different than the narcissistic world in which we find ourselves. So she was beautiful, yet she was also turned into an indentured servant for her stepmother and her stepsisters. One day, the kingdom announces a ball where the prince will find a new wife. And through a fairy godmother, she is, Cinderella is turned into a red carpet knockout. And the prince instantly falls in love with her. They dance all night. They talk. She leaves a shoe. He tirelessly looks for her. And love conquers all. Now, the takeaway from this tale is be patient with all these. Be patient. You're a scapegoat, but you'll be rescued and everything will be okay. The reality is, no, you won't. There are numerous narcissistic relationship red flags raised in Cinderella's story. But on top of the you will be rescued fantasy is also the magical thinking fantasy. I deserve things to work out after all I've been through, so something's going to come around and rescue me. How convenient. Here's a fairy godmother. So while Beauty and the Beast was about rescuing the toxic person, in that case the Beast, Cinderella is about being rescued. Now who knows if the prince in Cinderella was a nice guy or not? We don't know because we don't get to know him because they decided to get married after the second date. But the fact is that the idea that you may endure the scapegoated life and then just sort of quietly bide your time until you are rescued 
with a magically and conveniently delivered fairy godmother can dangerously put you in a passive role that can leave you stuck not only in a narcissistic family system, but also at risk for a partner who may control you and then the danger of you writing a story around that control as being rescue. If you want a happily ever after, you need to take responsibility for it and not wait for it to happen to you. Number three way that fairy tales get people into narcissistic trouble is that they foster the myth of sacrificing your voice for love, a la The Little Mermaid. Now, Ariel the mermaid is living her life with a bit of an authoritarian dad who wants to protect her from the world above the sea, knowing all of the risks that lurk above, I guess as a dad would want to protect his daughter. She is a rebel and an adventurer and then one day rescues, once again with the rescuing, a handsome prince. He sees her, she sees him, and she obsesses about him and desperately wants to be with him. So she makes a deal with the devil or the sea witch and trades her voice in return for legs because obviously she can't walk on a mermaid's tail so she can get on land and meet him. Now this was a very big deal in the story of the Little Mermaid because her voice was one of her greatest gifts and she was considered one of the most gifted singers under the sea as it were. Now as you can imagine this story really didn't sit well with me because when you think of it, what is a key dynamic in a classical narcissistic relationship? You lose your voice. Well, this gal lost her voice before the darn relationship even began. And so then, because she couldn't talk, she had to do all kinds of things to win him over. Dance and look pretty and do all that kind of hoop jumping that's classically part of a narcissistic relationship. So you can win them over and keep them. And then she does end up getting back her voice and then he sees who she really is and they live happily ever after. But she had to sacrifice her entire life and where she lived and all the people she knew so she could live in his world. So one would even argue yet another narcissistic relationship dynamic is to become isolated from all your sources of support. And by the way, the theme of sacrificing something that is so important to you is also that theme we also see in Rapunzel. She cuts off all her hair in the name of love. So there's a lot of this sort of sacrifice in the name of the relationship. The takeaway from the Little Mermaid story is if you give up everything that matters to you, then you can have the so-called prince. Now, the Little Mermaid hits several sorts of dangerous elements of what the risks are in entering a relationship that could raise risks for a narcissistic relationship. Leaving everything you know behind for a relationship, giving up your voice, and having to work hard to win someone over. The reality is that in real life, if you do all of that, you run a risk of being left isolated and overly reliant on this relationship, which can really be a slippery slope. Reason number four that these can set a bad precedent for narcissistic relationship, these fairy tales. You can meet someone and fall in love at first sight because the other person is so beautiful and everything moves really quickly and it all just works out which is every fairy tale ever written. Now, I'm being realistic. I do recognize that the era in which many fairy tales were composed meant that obviously courtships were brief events meant for really two people to sort of meet for a minute and then launch a lifetime commitment. Back when these fairy tales were written, lifetimes were also a heck of a lot shorter. But in nearly every fairy tale, they go from meeting to wedding sort of inside of a week. There is a very fast forward dramatic or love bomby feel to these relationships and sort of a bit of drama. Balls, coffins in the forest, leaving home, very dramatic starts and then a quick entry into a lifetime relationship that is believed to be perfect. Now we do know that relationships that move too quickly in modern times 
can often blind you to the toxic dynamics of narcissistic relationships and are often a signature characteristic when we do the post-mortem on a long-term narcissistic marriage. We got quick, we got married quick. The shambolic sort of meet, move in, get engaged, plan a wedding, when it all happens fast, can distract a person from really seeing how a partner operates under stress, under the ho-hum of day-to-day -day life, how they mesh with your life, how they mesh with your ideals and with your people. We don't get to see those sorts of get acquainted sequences in a fairy tale. We just go from chaos to wedding. And obviously it's meant to be a story to entertain us, but in real life, that can leave you stuck. Number five way that fairy tales can get people stuck in narcissistic relationships. If you kiss a frog, he'll turn into a prince. I mean, enough said there, okay? So yeah. The princess in the Frog Prince was sort of vehemently opposed to kissing the frog. She actually really wasn't that into him. And he kept trying to wear her down. And she finally kind of gave in, it was a bit coercive, and kissed him. And he turned into a prince. I think she had to kiss him a few times though. It's a bit of a riff on the whole Beauty and the Beast thing. But again, like I said, it felt a little coercive and manipulative. Now this myth also has elements of future faking in it. Kiss me. And down the line, it's going to work out for you. Now, the version of the story I read when I was a child had it that the princess had dropped her precious ball that she was playing with down a well, and the frog retrieved it. And when she offered him a reward, he basically asked her to take him into the palace and start a relationship with him. It seems like a bit of an extreme trade-off for someone rescuing your ball. Hey, I rescued your ball. Please give me your life. Now, the takeaway on the frog prince is to give in to the manipulations of an unprepossessing yet insistent suitor and giving him a chance because he may turn out to be a prince, which is a grandiose goal, and so you endure an uncomfortable relationship for a promise down the line. Once again, it's a story about doubting your instincts. She didn't want to be in a relationship with him and enduring something uncomfortable on the basis of a future promise, which is what often gets people trapped into a narcissistic relationship of any kind. Now, I know that some of you are sitting at home and rolling your eyes and saying, girl, what has gone wrong with you? And you might be even be thinking, I am being mean-spirited and going after whimsical childhood tales and memories. Listen, I know these stories so well because I was raised on them. I read them voraciously and then I had daughters who wanted to hear them over and over again. But when I read them as an adult and as a mother, I would find my brow very furrowed. For example, as I would read about Ariel's sacrificed voice. And I would then tell my daughters, that giving up your voice is never acceptable, that you have to keep your power. And my daughters would then face me down with protests of mommy, just please read us the story. So even when you had a teaching moment, I didn't really get to run with it. But the fact is this, childhood teachings shape us. They get under our psychic skin. And these myths sadly get transformed into the rom-coms which are the fairy tales for young women in our culture that still maintain the sort of meet cute, kind of forget the proverbial shoe, show up on your doorstep, give him a chance, ignore the red flags sort of love stories that always end up with a final scene of a wedding day and a presumed happily ever after. Now you will notice that most fairy tales don't have a part two because can you imagine Ariel getting up in her prince's face and saying to him, are you serious? You can't empty the dishwasher and I gave up a tail and a voice for you? Wow, you suck. We don't get to see that part of the story. It's not nearly as interesting as a wedding and our fantasies of happily ever after. Now, these fairy tales really can, in all seriousness, render people blind. And in a way, we can get caught and stuck in the childhood hope of rescue and blind faith, and that if I just try hard enough, 
I can win him over. It'll all work out. I can make it okay. A fairy tale could be about, imagine a healthy fairy tale. What if we had a healthy fairy tale about a person taking the time to get to know someone, ensuring that they are compassionate, avoiding the drama, being their own authentic selves, and creating something collaborative. It's interesting that that kind of fairy tale has never really entered the lexicon of little children's bookshelves. Now, I'm not saying that you need to give up on your fairy tales, but in your own life, I want you to focus on being a realist. It's the only way to see the red flags and respect yourself enough to honor them. And remind yourself that you are responsible for your own happily ever after. You know, I, as you think about those five things, again, I'm not trying to just be snarky in this video. You might be thinking, well, they're not narcissists. The princes weren't narcissists. It's not about the people in the story. It's about the themes that get celebrated in these fairy tales. And the people who are hearing this are people who are impressionable. And honestly, those narratives and scripts we get about relationships early in life can definitely leave an echo, especially in those who may come from family systems where they're already not getting a healthy message about relationships. And when this happens at a societal level, when these kinds of fairy tale stories become sort of the go-to on what a relationship looks like, you can see that there might be a lot of hidden kinds of treachery in these fairy tales that, listen, you got kids, they're going to want to hear the fairy tales. But as they get older, allow yourself to open up to the idea that there are some issues hidden in how these sorts of classical tropes present relationships. And to make sure you do do the correction, that when we romanticize something like giving up your voice to be in a relationship, what kind of lesson does that set someone up for should they encounter a narcissist that may play upon that vulnerability? Not meaning to take away your fairy tale mojo, but I do challenge some of you out there to start writing some new ones that are healthy and safeguard people's hearts and souls a little bit better. Thanks again for tuning in. As always, please hit that subscribe button to be able to be part of this channel and this wonderful community. Hit that bell to get notifications. And as always, thank you.